Steve Ensminger was a guest on Off the Bench uh, with Hester. Hester was sitting in for T-Bob today, so Hester and Jordy were on Off the Bench. And Ensminger, who, as we know, notoriously just doesn't like to do a lot of in- interviews, uh, from time to time, Hester can can prod Ensminger and, uh, and get him on the phone. So they did that this morning and talked about a lot. It, it mostly uh, what I wanted to focus on, though, was looking ahead. Was Ensminger looking ahead to next year? Because it's just seldom that we get his perspective because, generally speaking, he'll do the, the obligatory interview on a media day if we have a media day, and he'll do the obligatory interview before the bowl game when the coordinator's press conferences happen, and that's it. So anytime we get Ensminger's perspective on things, I want to hear it. So here was Steve, uh, too, please, talking about the 2020 season and what it, it was kind of phrased like what he thinks about the team, even though you had a very limited spring practice. But here's his general thoughts. I wish we could be talking right now after 15 days of spring practice, to be honest with you. You know, when you lose probably eight guys on offense that they're all going to play pro football, you need the repetition. You need you need those guys who are taking Sadiq Charles' place, who's taking Adilu's place, who's taking uh, Lloyd Christianberry, who's taking the new tight end, who's taking Je- Justin Jefferson's place, Joe Burrow and Clyde Edwards. Mm-hmm. And so I remember two years ago when we were talking, I think we were talking, I know we were, uh, about spring football. And I, I said, hell, I don't know who our center is. I don't know who our quarterback is. I don't know who our running back is. But well, right now, there's eight positions that, that we have to answer right now. And, and don't get me wrong, uh, I think we're a very talented team. I, and I think they're very capable. But those guys need the reps. Those guys need the repetition and everything else. But I'm excited about it. I really am. I, I hate to say this. That's the reason I don't do interviews. I hate to say this in public. It's like a, I challenge our guys. I say, you know, hey, probably the best offense uh, we've ever had here at LSU and you know what it's your job to break all those records you got to love the approach I mean that's 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 what you want to hear from the coach challenging his players like that but whenever we have this conversation about all the players that LSU lost whichever side of the line you go it's a mouthful if you start listing all the players LSU lost it's over it's an overwhelming mouthful if I go Joe Burrow Clyde Edwards Elair Justin Jefferson Thaddeus Moss, Lloyd Cushenberry, Damian Lewis, Sadiq Charles, Caleb on Chasson, Patrick Queen, Grant Delpit, Christian Fulton, Rashard Lawrence, Michael Divinity. You know what I mean? Like it feels overwhelming when you do when you do that exercise. But similarly, if you start listing everybody LSU as back, you can feel really good. Like you can say, man, Jamar Chase returns. Terrace Marshall is back. You got the number one tight end in the country in Eric Gilbert. You've got Ed Ingram back. You've got Austin Deculus back. You got a couple of guys who have played at different times, like Chase and Hines. Flip it over to the other side of the ball. Neil Farrell is back. Glenn Logan is back. Look in the middle of that defense with Damone Clark. And now you just added the best All America linebacker transfer in the country. And oh, by the way, there's Derek Stingley and Todd Harris is back and Jacoby Stevens is back for his senior year and Maurice Hampton, who emerged late, is back. You know what I mean? So like you can have that experience too where you start to go, damn, they got a lot of talent next year and they do, but they still replace a ton. The The number from pro football, I'm sorry, it was uh, it was ESPN's FPI uh, or Stats and Info that uh, that released it a couple of weeks back. Of the 130 FBS teams, as far as production returning, LSU is 127 out of 130. LSU is 127 out of 130 in production returning. They, they lost everybody that was producing last year, but they got a ton of talent back as well. You answer a few of those key questions, and it could be a really fun year. So Steve Ensminger talked about, as we mentioned, the 2019 season, but I was more interested in him looking ahead to 2020 uh we let you hear him talking about everything that they have to replace and how we wish they would have had a a 50 a full complement of 15 spring practices to start to get some of those answers uh one of the people they had to replace obviously was joe brady the passing game coordinator they replaced him with scott linehan veteran coach of course former nfl head coach tons of nfl experience but not joe brady uh a very different mold you went from the youngest coordinator in college football to a, a man pushing 60 years old um not that 
you, you can't be successful if you're in your, your late 50s. But it's just very different, a very different approach from what they did a year ago with Joe Brady. Here was Ensminger talking about working with Scott Linehan. It's been really good. You know, uh, Scott's come in, and, and I, I said, okay, here, here's your role. Here's what Joe did and everything else. You know, Joe was in charge of our third down, uh, every one of our third down calls, third and three or, or plus. Uh, Joe was in charge of our tight zone, some of our red zone, everything else, in charge of our passing game. I think we have a pretty good passing game right now, and, and Scott has come in, and he, we've watched everything we can watch, some of the things that, that, that he likes, some of the things that uh, he, he's brought some new plays to us. And uh, Scott understands that, you know, we have – really uh, going through every third down that we could go through and, and Scott has done it and he's added some stuff to us that we have he has added some stuff into our red zone into our tight zone so I'm looking forward to it I, I, I keep watching plays where uh, he was at Detroit and he was at Dallas and everything else and so I'm excited about it I, I think he's going to bring a lot to the table we've expanded our offense with this passing system and everything else what we've done was pretty good and, and what Scott brings to the table I, I think it's going to make us a little bit better I really do so there's a couple of interesting things there saying, number one, they've expanded the offense. And that does make sense. I, I, think of it, just think of it intellectually. If you are a college coach where you're going to play 12 games and you know in some of those games you're not going to show everything you have, and aside from just coaching football, you also have the obligation of recruiting and making sure that your student athletes are going to class and maintaining you know, APR and all that sort of stuff. It's not just all ball all the time. So naturally, adjustments in college football don't always come as quickly as they do in the NFL where it is all ball all the time and you have no limits on staff. So it is real reasonable to think that someone with 30 years of NFL experience is going to who's had to make different game plans and adjust every single week for 16 games is going to have different perspectives and and plays and concepts than a coach who's green but brought something just new to your offense which Joe Brady clearly did. So I do totally believe that Scott Linehan has brought some different ideas and concepts. Now does it mirror the direction that LSU was going a year ago with Joe Brady? That's a big question. We won't know that answer until we actually see them go play ball. But I do believe that that you will have an expand, even ex further expanded playbook. The other thing that is maybe a benefit of, of this circumstance is this is a time where Coaches normally would be on the road recruiting and doing all the all of the ancillary things outside of just coaching ball. And all of these coaches now have this opportunity to work with each other more closely, to to know each other better, to to look at film cut ups. You heard Steve Ensminger say, "I've looked at every play he called in Detroit and Dallas." I mean, what like if you're a coach, it's a football junkie. What else are you going to do right now? That actually makes a ton of sense. Uh, so while Yes, you, you would love for them to have had 15 spring practices and to have had all the time um, with, with players on the field to work on a new offense and to figure out some of the personnel groupings. If you're looking for the positive side of this, that's it, that your coaching staff is getting a, an opportunity to delve deeper into X's and O's and game plan and scouting reports and get to know each other better. So when they do return to the field for whatever type of fall camp, whenever that is, the coaching staff is going to be well-equipped to do so. Now, of course, players have to make plays, and none is going to matter more than Miles Brennan replacing Joe Burrow. Um, Steve Ensminger gave an interesting perspective on Miles sitting behind Joe Burrow. Any other place in this country uh, or any other kid in this country would have been gone. Right. They'd have transferred. But he wanted to be a Tiger. He wanted to be a quarterback at LSU and everything else. The best thing that happened to him was sitting in a room and watching film with Joe and studying Joe and, and talking to Joe and everything else. I saw the difference in Miles Brandon in three practices this spring uh, that I have not seen since he's been here. And he's more focused. He, he understands what it takes to be a great quarterback. And I think Joe taught him that. And, and, and I think he's ready for it. Earlier this week on the show, I made the case for the Saints taking Jordan Love at 24 if he's there and the linebackers are gone uh, because I love the idea of giving a young quarterback a redshirt year to sit behind a great quarterback and learn. I kind of I draw the comparison to like really any business or, or any profession. If you want to be an attorney, 
wouldn't it serve you well to be able to shadow a great trial attorney to learn how she or he goes about their business? If you want to be a doctor, wouldn't it benefit you to watch a world-class surgeon go through surgery and preparation to see how they do things? Why is it any different with a football player? Having Miles Brennan watch Joe Burrow for the last two years, the, the maniacal way and commitment which he had, the maniacal way he worked, that, that has to benefit Miles Brennan. And how different that is than the perspective he had when he first got on campus. It's not a knock on Danny Etling, but Danny Etling ain't Joe Burrow. It's not to say Danny didn't work hard, but you're l- watching the guy who literally had the greatest single season in the history of college football. Through 60, 60 touchdown passes. I still think this doesn't always fully sink into people to understand. Joe Burrow threw 60 touchdown passes in a college season. 50 in an NFL season when Peyton Manning did it was like the most amazing thing anybody had seen. Miles Brennan getting to watch Joe Burrow the way he worked. I hope those lessons penetrated his being, his mind and his being, so he could see and emulate a lot of that because it undoubtedly makes a difference. If you're Miles Brennan, you had certain practices, habits, the way you watched film, how often you did, how you worked out, the way you interacted with your coaches, and then you see Joe Burrow do it at at an extremely high level, do it differently, I would hope you'd pick up things. Did you hear Steve Ensman get that part? Did you hear that part? I said, can you run that back? It was near the end. He said, I've seen, I think it was something effective. I've seen a more, a more of a change in Miles Brennan in three spring practices than any time that he had been at LSU. It's an, I mean, you're talking about, about a guy that's been here for three seasons already. In three practices, he saw more than he did in three seasons of Miles Brennan. You have that? Yeah, hit that. I saw the difference in Miles Brennan in three practices this spring uh, that I have not seen since he's been here. That's yeah. amazing. Three practices, more so than three years. One more from Ensminger on Miles Brennan and running this offense here in 2020. He's done everything we've asked him to do. You know, we, we check on our players and we zoom our players every day. Miles Brennan right now is 216 pounds. You know, hmm. he's added weight on. He's, he's more comfortable in the pocket. I took every play he had last year and uh, made a cut up of it and went through it. And, and it was a good and bad tape. Hey, things he did good and things he did bad. And I'll be honest, we didn't play him very much. But I'm saying his efficiency on the plays he was in there was above 90%. And I think he's going to be better this year. I'm excited to see him run this offense. Y'all, I'm not sitting there trying to tell you that I think Miles Brennan's going to be an All-American. I'm not trying to tell you Miles Brennan's going to win a Heisman. I'm not telling you Miles Brennan's going to be a first-round pick. I, I'm not... I'm not telling you that the coaches are convinced Miles Brennan's going to be any of those things, but when Steve Ensminger, who is as candid a coach as you'll ever find, says those types of things, it at least gives you the confidence to think Miles Brennan could, could be a productive starter. And I'll continue to stress this uh, until they kick it off and probably through the season. Look at the roster of quarterbacks in the Southeastern Conference this year. If you ever want to know why, like, and sometimes it works out this way. There was a season similar to this in 2014. If you remember, 2013 was a great year of quarterbacks. You had a bunch of veteran guys like A.J. McCarron who had won national titles, and you had Zach Mettenberger and Aaron Murray who set all the records, and Connor Shaw was at South Carolina who had back-to-back-to-back 11-win seasons. Like It was this great quarterback year in the SEC in 2013, and all at once – all those guys were gone, and then you had Anthony Jennings. <laughs> you know, I mean, no disrespect to Anthony, but it was just a very different year. I think this is going to be similar, a similar type of year in the SEC, where when you look at the quarterbacks in the league, where's the star? I mean, where's the star? I mean, uh, Stephen Miller, a listener, sent me this tweet, which I hadn't seen. This is from uh, a, a, an SEC podcast where they ranked the quarterbacks in the league for next year. 
They got Kyle Trask as the best quarterback in the SEC. And it's not implausible. They got Brennan number two. Who would you put there? Mac Jones, three. Kellen Mond, four. Terry Wilson from Kentucky, five. Bo Nix at six. Ryan Holinsky, seven. John Rice Plumley, Jamie Newman, the grad transfer from Georgia or from uh, from uh, Wake Forest, who's at Georgia, who may end up being a really good player, maybe not. They got Jared Garantano at ten. He may not even start. KJ Costello, the grad transfer from Stanford at Mississippi State. Felipe Franks at Arkansas. Sean Robinson at Missouri. I don't even know who that is. If Sean Robinson walked in the door and punched me in the balls, I wouldn't know who he was. And then Danny Clark from Vanderbilt. Is that, is that even a real person? Musso, if I asked you candidly, do you know who Danny Clark was 30 seconds ago? Would you have known? No. Nah. Thank you for your honesty, especially for a cheating Red Sox fan. Uh, mm. Cheaters. But my point, is, my point is, you look up and down the roster of SEC quarterbacks for next year, and it ain't great, which is why the league feels pretty wide open in 2020. LSU replaces a ton, no doubt. They have a lot of talent back. And you you, you show me the guy that strikes fear in your heart. Go, oh, man, not looking forward to playing that guy. It's, he's not there. He's not there. It's not to say somebody won't emerge and be great. We, if we had this conversation this time last year, people weren't saying that about Joe Burrow. And then, obviously, look what happened. But as of right now, that guy right there. 